Glaucoma is a very common eye disorder in North America, actually worldwide. <clears throat> the, the disease is called a silent thief of the night because there are no symptoms. The patient goes blind <clears throat> after several years of undiagnosed glaucoma. So therefore undiagnosed, therefore untreated glaucoma, <clears throat> and the patient will go blind. Before we get to the pathophysiology, let's look at, uh, because the disorder is treated with eye drops, lifelong eye drops. So let's review how to administer eye drops. Chart 58-5. <clears throat> I won't read it for you. You've either given actual eye drops in the nursing home during your second semester, or at any time, at any point, you've seen how it was done. So here's the procedure again. Okay. Uh, very important here is not touching the tip of the medication container to any part of the eye, meaning do not contaminate the tip of the dropper. All right. So the, the dropper gets contaminated, then the whole um, medication is now contaminated. So where do we drop the eyeball? I mean, the eye drop? Okay, not on the eyeball, okay? It's only on the lower conjunctival sac. Now, why is it, uh, why do we wait? Um, let me show you the procedure here. So after application of an eye drop, we apply what? Pressure where? Okay, the inner canthus is also called the punctum. So whenever you see the term punctal occlusion or inner canthus application of pressure, that means the same thing. Why is this done? Because you don't want to cause the medication to spread. All right, because there, the lacrimal duct is in the inner canthus, so therefore the medication will run into the lacrimal duct entering your oral cavity and then getting absorbed <clears throat> systemically. Now, always use a clean tissue. Now, <clears throat> the, the rationale for waiting five minutes before instilling another eye drop <clears throat> or 10 minutes before instilling another ointment is if the patient applies two, two drops of a medication consecutively, the conjunctival sac can only hold the volume equal to one drop. So therefore, if you administer two drops after another, you know, one drop after another without waiting five minutes, then what will happen to the medication? It gets washed out. Okay, so the, again, the lower conjunctival sac can only hold one drop worth of volume. So that's why you have to wait. Because if you put two drops, what happens to the second drop? It's like you sprayed it to the floor. Okay? And then we wonder why the patient goes blind. Because they never got their medications. <clears throat> Which is easy to do. If you're in a hurry, you tend to do that. Okay, You just don't care. Right? And patient's blind. Okay, glaucoma, <clears throat> like I said, is very common. Now, testing starts at childhood. So it's now standard for any eye exam to include <clears throat> measurement of the intraocular pressure. Everyone who sees an eye doctor here, people who wear eyeglasses, uh, Nuasu, you, your, your ophthalmologist, uh, your optometrist tests your IOP, correct? Okay. Uh, there's two ways to do that. They blow a puff of air into your eyeball, yeah? <clears throat> And then I, I don't know what they call the, the other one. So physiology. So how, how does glaucoma develop? It has something to do with aqueous humor. What is aqueous humor? This is the fluid in your eyeball. This gives the eyeball its round shape. It's constantly produced and drained at a steady rate. Meaning, do we want a stagnant pool of liquid any anywhere in our body? No, it should constantly be 
produced and drained, okay? Constantly. So as long as the production and drainage is equal, the pressure remains normal, which is zero to 15. <clears throat> if the patient's production increases and or the drainage of the aqueous humor decreases, is there still a balance between production and drainage? Yeah. What happens to pressure? It increases. So as the pre as the pressure increases inside the elbow eyeball, then that will damage the ocular nerve, <laughs> leading to blindness. Risk factors chart fifty eight six. Select all that apply question. Maybe. <clears throat> So since the problem with <clears throat> with glaucoma is one of the one of the two conditions, which is either increased production of aqueous humor and or <clears throat> decreased drainage of the aqueous humor, what do you think the treatment will be? What will the eye drops do? One, eye drops will either decrease the aqueous humor production or increase the drainage. So this will involve vasodilating agents. So we will have um, must, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, drugs that will cause vasodilation or relaxation of the muscles. Therefore, if they relax, then they dilate, correct? <clears throat> okay, so they dilate, therefore promoting drainage of the medication. We'll get to the medications on another uh, section. Now, there are different types of glaucoma. <clears throat> For our purpose, we will only do the <clears throat> uh, acute and chronic because there are um, they are the two major types of glaucoma. Well, actually, it's the chronic type, but acute narrow angle glaucoma, since that is an emergency, which the patient will go blind in a matter of hours. So we need to know the symptoms of that. Okay, so that we can teach the patient what to report. Um, so it's, it's, it's an emergency. So of course that falls under emergency measures, which is on the NTLEX test plan. So between these two, wide and narrow angle glaucoma, and we also have the <clears throat> uh, acute narrow angle glaucoma, which will be mentioned later. Manifestations. Here they are. So like I said, there are really no symptoms. Okay? The patient goes about their day not knowing they have glaucoma. The patient only seeks help or goes to the eye doctor once they have the symptoms of the complications now, which indicate the disease is already advanced and that the patient's um, blindness is imminent. Uh, all we can do at that point is just preserve what remaining vi vision the patient has. There's nothing, there's no way to recover any lost vision. Once vision is lost, that's it. So blurred vision or halos around lights, <clears throat> these are complications. We'll talk about the, the these conditions a little later under retinal disorder. The vision loss in glaucoma is specifically the the, the first vision loss will be the peripheral vision. So the patient will have tunnel vision, okay? meaning they will lose their peripheral vision, which is that dangerous? Yes, so with driving, with walking, okay, so that, that can be dangerous. Depending on, even more dangerous, depending on what type of job this patient does for a living. Now, when they say here, the, these terms that they say wide or narrow angle glaucoma, this angle that they're talking about, the angle here that they're referring to is really these here. So this is your the front of your eye. So you've got oh, that didn't help, did it? <laughs> Let's stay here. All right. So these are the canals through which your aqueous humor drains. So it's produced inside the eyeball and then they, just like a river, 
they exit the eyeball and then drain through these canals. These canals are what we call angles because really they are angles, right? So the aqueous humor enters these, uh, if you want to call them uh, streams, okay? So these are canals through which they drain and then they drain into your oral cavity and then leaves the body. Through inflammation, let's say, look at the risk factors again mentioned here. We have old age, number one. Then we've got eye trauma, diabetes. So these conditions here cause some form of inflammation and swelling in the fragile structures in the eye. When they do that, then they close or narrow the angles or those canals that we see in the front of the eye decreasing the drainage of your aqueous humor, a leading to increased IOP and uh, eventually blindness. There's a table here. <clears throat> like I said, we will only do the two most common, which are wide angle. Uh, we'll skip the normal tension. That's not very popular. So only the wide and narrow angle glaucoma. But again, because there is the life-threatening type, which is acute angle closure glaucoma, this will be included, all right? Because this is, again, an ocular emergency. Here, tells you on the third column, it's an ocular emergency. So patient needs to be seen by an ophthal ophthalmologist right away and undergo surgery. I have no questions on diagnostic testing. Let's go straight to the management. So how do we treat glaucoma? So the nature again is because the intraocular pressure is high, the, the damage to the ocular nerve and to the retina is, is already happening. So our goal is to prevent further optic nerve damage. So we try to preserve whatever vision the patient has left. As you can see here, glaucoma, there's no cure for glaucoma. All right. So therefore, what we can do is once diagnosed, so therefore, when do we want to diagnose this? Okay, as soon as possible, as early as possible. There are kids that are diagnosed with glaucoma. No, grade school kids, five year old, six years old. Okay, so they already have glaucoma. So these patients will have to have eye drops for the rest of their life. Now it's different if it's an adult. Okay, we can teach an adult easily, right? With the children, yes, they learn quickly, but the problem is compliance. Because as a child, will the child, you know, look cool to their friends putting in eye drops? No, right? Especially if there's peer pressure right? Uh, teenagers especially. So that can be a problem. But it's important to teach the patient the, the, the purpose of the treatment that there's really nothing cool about being blind, right? They need to understand that the purpose of the eye drops is to save their vision, okay? Which again, it's, couldn't, it's not easy, okay? Uh, there's several... Um, uh, there's several factors, uh, especially if the, we're, we're dealing with uh, a younger child. Old people, you know, they usually are institutionalized, so they depend on us. You know, we, we administer eye drops whether they like it or not. All right, let's go to the painful part now, medications. Table 58-5. So the ones, like I said, as usual from last week under seizures, so all, everything I highlight are on the exam. Now, these patients will be on multiple, okay? So most glaucoma patients will be on two or more eye drops. So first are pilocarpin. These are cholinergics. Look at the action. Column number two. Increases aqueous humor outflow by contracting the ciliary muscle, causing meiosis. If you constrict the pupil, then that means you open the angle. Okay, 
increasing drainage. And here's your nursing responsibility on the third column. Next, timolol. It's a very common eye drop. It's a beta blocker in the form of an eye drop. So therefore, can it be systemically absorbed? Okay. And just like any other beta blocker, it will cause bradycardia and low blood pressure. So since a it's a beta blockers are basically vasodilators, right? Okay, so therefore they also decrease uh, aqueous humor production. And we've got, next drug is brimonidine. Next, acetosolamide. This is a diuretic. Then finally, you have latanoprost. And that's it. Take note of the details, especially on the third and fourth columns. Okay? Mm -hmm. So side effects, because like this one, for instance, if there's darkening of the iris, oh, will yeah. the patient be alarmed with this? Yes. Okay. So tell the patient, you know, yeah, that's a side effect of latanoprost. So that, that well, what does it say here? Oh, sorry. Okay. So do they report it or not? Yes. <clears throat> Just to make sure. Okay. So the doctor needs to be notified so that the patient's aware. So besides the eye drops, they need to be monitored twice yearly. Because these are glaucoma patients for the rest of us who have just vision problems. So it's okay once a year, yeah? But these patients have to be seen twice a year. <clears throat> Surgical management. I will not cover because these are not very common and not really very successful, except the one for acute angle closure glaucoma. Uh, that one, which is iridectomy, um, will save the patient's vision. Okay, But this one, uh, the other, like the lasers, they don't really, I mean, they promote... Um, Drainage, okay, they open the angles, but again, they don't eliminate the need for the eye drops. Are we clear? Because what, what did we say earlier? Is there a cure for glaucoma? No. They can improve the symptoms, but again, do they cure glaucoma? No. So they still continue with uh, eye drops after the surgery. So I mentioned iridotomy. Okay, so these are... Uh, common um, surgical options for especially acute angle closure glaucoma. So for teaching, here's your chart, 58-7. Emphasize again the lifelong administration of the eye drops. Now the problem with long-term eye drop use is it's not really, let me show you the, because there are, you've all had eye drops at some point, yeah? Let's say for allergies or, um, I don't know, you have pink eye maybe. Okay. So what did you feel when you applied an eye drop? Was it pleasant? Was it comfortable? Did you feel refreshed yes. and very nice? Yeah. No. Are you sure? Yeah. Or did it cause burning, tearing? Okay, I'm not saying it'll burn forever, but was there a burning sensation? Yes. Was there t increased tearing? Was there some irritation and redness? Yes. Yes, but only for a moment, yeah? Now, these do not disappear. No matter how many years, decades, these patients are taking the eye drops, do these disappear? No, because we're, our eyeballs are not designed to receive eye drops. Okay? It's supposed to have tears, right? Tears. That, that's, we, we don't really apply. We're not supposed to apply anything over the eyeball. 
But because we are, then of course, that will elicit these protective responses. Yeah, because you put, uh, basically, is the eye drop a foreign object? Yes, and what? How will how does our body protect again the eyeball against these foreign objects? By, okay, there is tearing, there is, there is, um, yeah, burning sensation, okay, redness. That's that's the response. That's a normal response by the eyeball. Okay, it's a protective response. So they don't disappear. Okay, so they will last as long as you're still using the eye drops. All right. Does everybody understand? Yeah. Very good, children. Uh, I'll go back to the ointment. Let's go back to the procedure here. If it's an eye drop, yeah, we put the eye drop there. Now for the ointment, which is this, we put the a ribbon of the ointment from the outer to the inner canthus. Now, if we apply the ointment, is it thick or thin liquid? It's thick. So therefore, is there a need to apply pressure in the inner punctum? There's no need. But take note, how long do we wait between an eye drop and an, an ointment? 10 minutes. What about between, between drops? Five minutes. Now take note, the five minutes really applies if it's two different medications. Mm -hmm. If it's the same medication, you can wait one to two minutes. Okay, that's okay. But if it's two different drugs, five minutes ideally. Now that can be challenging. Let's say you work in a nursing home. You have 40 patients to give medications to. Ten of them have glaucoma and they have two or maybe three eye drops. So how are you going to do it? You have one hour to complete the medications because some patients are, no, 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 I don't want to go down. Okay? Leave me alone. It's too early for that. Okay. Anybody planning to work in a nursing home here? No, no. Absolutely. Well, you say that now, but. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's go to cataracts. Okay, cataracts, <clears throat> it, it is the lens opacity or cloudiness of the lens. Now, contrary to belief that it's age-related, yes, but there are actually other cases of cataracts occurring in younger people. So here are the, here's a picture of a very ripe cataract. Okay, so look at the lens, it's now opaque, it's very cloudy, so it's like, your windshield is full of mud, okay? That's what your vision will look like. Very blurry. Can actually lead to blindness. Manifestations, <clears throat> there's no pain. Yes? Mm, not necessarily. This is just the lens, okay? So again, painless, blurry vision. And the patient's complaints will be, you know, they can't see. There's like there's a there's a there's something in front of their eye. Okay. The, the, when they read, they can't, you know, read clearly, no matter how many times they change their eyeglasses, doesn't work. There's double vision, blurred vision. Again, I have no question on the diagnostic because we, I mean, we're not the ones doing it. Okay, it's the optometrist or the ophthalmologist. So let's go straight to medical management. The only cure is surgery. So we need to remove the lens. The doctor will decide whether or not to put in a new lens, meaning not all people will have a lens implant. But that's how you cure cataracts. You remove the lens, you, you remove the cloudy lens and then there you go, your vision's clear again. Now, yes, it's true there is no other cure.
However, you can decrease the, the likelihood of it getting worse, meaning you can slow it down because not all people are good can candidates for surgery. For instance, diabetics um, are not very good candidates okay, for, uh, for cataract. Now, these strategies here, which can decrease the likelihood of them getting worse or, 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 or making them progress faster, smoking cessation, weight reduction, glucose, and blood pressure control as well. We'll get to the surgery shortly. Here are the risk factors. So it's not true that it's only age. Age is just one. One factor, but there are toxins or exposure to chemicals or organisms, okay? infections, for instance, they can trigger cataracts. Toxins such as these, chemicals, smoking again, or long term steroids can cause or precipitate the development of cataracts, or obesity, poor nutrition, and trauma also or exposure to the sun, UV, UV light, and x-rays, and some of these conditions. So diabetes top the list. So most diabetics do develop cataracts, especially if they're not um, managing the sugar very well. Okay, I have no question on table 58-6. We'll skip this. Let's go to the post-op care. which is chart 58-9. Okay. Providing post-op care. Now, not just the chart because there are interventions mentioned in the paragraph as well. So from beginning from this paragraph to the paragraph after the chart. So let's start here. So we need to teach the patient. So imagine you just had eye surgery. <clears throat> So they remove the lens with a scalpel, okay? So what type of, um, what did the surgery do to the eye? Was it trauma? Yeah. So therefore, if you have trauma to the eye, is it any different from getting punched in the eye or getting a football hit, hit by a football in your eyeball? Same. So what will it look like after the surgery? Not black and blue, but red. Okay, red, bloodshot, yes. Okay, swollen. Okay, will there be pain? Yeah. Yes, the pain, though, must not be severe. If it's severe, that's something else. That's already considered a retinal detachment or maybe also um, a retinal, retinal tear. Okay, we'll get to that later under retinal disorders. Now, while it's true that there are no medications given for cataracts, however, there are eye drops mentioned here. This is for post-op purposes. Ex exactly because there is trauma to the eyeball, there's swelling, there's a bloodshot appearance, there's irritation. So will we require eye drops to treat those manifestations? Yes, but it's not for the cataract. Are we clear? These are more like post-op eye drops, okay? To reduce the swelling, to prevent infection, etc. So the eye drops expected after the surgery are the following. So we've got antibiotics, steroids, and anti-inflammatory eye drops. Okay, so do we need to teach the patient how to administer eye drops? Yeah. Okay, so we go back to the chart we had discussed earlier for the steps. As most likely, it will be the caregiver administering the eye drops, right? Or worse, if the, what if the patient lives alone? Then they'll have to learn how to administer their own eye drop. And here's the chart. Now take note, although this says intraocular lens implant, this is actually applicable to any eye surgery because whatever they did to the eyeball, whether it's a lens implant, cataract, cataractectomy, is it surgery to the eye? Yeah. Yes. So therefore, will post-op care be different? No, because it's the same eyeball that you traumatized, right? Okay. So here, look at the activities. Look at the restricted activities. So any any condition that involves lifting, pushing, pulling. So let's say sexual activity, for instance, or let's say driving or bending over. Okay? So all these involve what? 
pushing and pulling, right? So therefore, what are you doing when you push and pull? No, what do you need to do? Let's say before you can, okay, you take in a deep breath and hold it, correct? So when you do that, take in a deep breath, that means you fill both lungs up with air, correct? And then you hold it. So what are the two lungs doing to the heart? Like I'm the heart, and then these two lungs on my side inflate and do not let go. So what happens to venous drainage from the head? Okay, because now the heart is squeezed, so blood from the brain, can it drain normally into the heart? No. So therefore, what happens to pressure inside the head? And where is the eyeball located? In the head, okay. So therefore, any so it'll be the same. Any increase in intracranial pressure will also increase intraocular pressure. So you'll see this again next semester when we do brain trauma, brain surgery, uh, TBI, with traumatic brain injury, and also in stroke. Okay, because it's the same principle. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So these will look familiar again next semester. Why? Why do we have to include here with showering and sh shampooing the hair? What's the big deal? Okay, because whenever you wash your hair, you wash your eyes, correct? Okay, so therefore, do we want, the basically, what is this saying? Do we want to get the eyeball wet? No. No. So therefore, should they be showering? So there should be. Okay, so just, if you really want to wash your hair, then it should be away from the eye okay can they take a bath yeah yes just don't submerge your head in the bath water right okay avoid lying on the side of the affected eye well self-explanatory yeah because what happens to pressure if you lay on that side okay. so again any activity that involves holding your breath okay so it's not limited to these activities what about uh let's say you go karaoke and you're doing journey songs or maybe Mariah Carey. That's a lot of holding your breath, yeah? Okay. Okay, so climbing, descending stairs, again, you are holding your breath there. Uh, what to report are here under describe signs and symptoms of complications, so any vision change, well, as far as vision change, yes, the vision is supposed to improve, but because of all the swelling and redness and irritation, will there be clear vision after surgery? No. no. It won't be clear until all the swelling goes down. So it'll be a few a few days, a few weeks, okay, before your clear vision um is evident. But you Report these flashing lights because that indicates retinal detachment, redness or swelling. Again, pain is expected, but not, but not severe pain. Now let's go to the discharge. What is the characteristics of the discharge when you wake up in the morning in your eyeball? You know, in the inner canthus, you know, when you clean your eye. What's the what's that drainage that you you you, you get? Thick and crusty? Yeah. Well, if it's crusty, it's either hard or it's like really There's something wrong with your eye. <laughs> no, do you think it burns? That thing, right? What? Yes. Do you know what I'm talking about? The crust the okay, so it's either clear or white, yeah? Okay. So anything colorful, like yellow, green, orange, is that normal? Okay. That? Yeah, that uh, sounds like pus, yeah? Okay. And that's about it. So here, um, remember the eye is injured, yeah? <clears throat> so therefore, when you sleep, you do have control over your actions. So what will be the patient's expectation here? Wear an eye patch to protect the eye so you don't scratch it in your sleep. So that should be in the first 48 hours. I have several siblings who've had cataract surgery, so I'm guessing I will need one too. Because I mean, you know, everybody so far that's turned 70 in my family has had 
cataracts. So I guess a few years I'll have it too. So keep in mind, so the complete vision improvement won't be expected until six to 12 weeks. Okay, so be realistic. So some patients may start complaining, you know, bad mouthing the doctor. Ah, I'm not supposed to we have clear vision. Okay, but not until six to two, uh, 12 weeks. Any question? Okay, let's proceed with the eye disorders. Okay, let's go to retinal disorders. First one is detachment. Most causes of retinal detachment is trauma. Trauma including surgery. Okay. So the trauma could be you hit your head pretty hard on, let's say, uh, you know, uh, on a cabinet <clears throat> or whatever you were doing under the table or, you know, you, you hit your head for, for, for whatever reason. So that can be enough to cause retinal detachment. So surgery is included here, including cataract surgery or any other eye surgery that can cause the retina to detach. So think of retinal detachment as, you know how you have a sticker? When you peel off a sticker and you have the paper backing, right? And then you have the sticker. So it's like that. So your retina is supposed to be stuck to your, to the back of your eyeball. Okay, so that, that's how it works. So it's attached to the optic nerve. And that will cause, you know, whatever you're looking at, light, light reflex, and then it bounces off against the retina. And then those specialized cells send the signals to your optic nerve. And then you recognize what you're seeing. Like, ah, I can see Zini, okay? I see Zuma, okay? Ah, yeah, very nice, okay, to be not blind. But now you have retinal detachment. So whatever the precipitating event was, usually, again, trauma, cause the retina to detach. So now, what happens to the vision? Blurred. Okay, so, well, there can be blurred vision, but really the manifestations, as you see here, uh, is flashing bright lights. The floaters here are actually pieces of uh, red blood cells uh, because it causes bleeding. So those floaters are those blood cells that go in front of your of your retina. And that's what the patient complains about. They, there are floaters, okay? Uh, usually no pain, but again, if the floaters are there, flashing bright lights, is this an emergency? Yes, we need to fix it right away. You have a question, Yaya? Yeah, yeah? Uh, again, diagnostic, we don't take part in that. Let's go to the management. Now, the management, you can watch these videos. They're nice videos. I cannot stand watching it um, without, you know, without crying. Not like crying, even like tear. Okay, it makes me tear up because ah, I can't, I can't, you know, imagine all that trauma. Now, imagine, let's look at the scleral buckle, okay? So what is a buckle? Okay, so you're gonna wrap something up. There's a picture here. Look at this buckle. This is a scleral buckle. That's in the middle of the eyeball, right? Okay, so just imagine how did they get there? How did they wrap that buckle around the eyeball? Okay, there's about six to eight strings you know, by strings, I mean sutures. So they'll rip your eye apart six different ways because they need to move it around in order to put this buckle around the eyeball. Now imagine how how they did that. Okay, and then you, if, if you're interested, go ahead and watch videos on YouTube. Oh, but I don't want to watch it. <laughs> so do you wonder how it, it's traumatic? Hey, the surgery itself is also traumatic, yeah? 
Now, there's an option here uh, called the, the, the use of a air bubble or gas right here. So in vitrectomy, which is an option besides scleral buckling, is the injection of a gas bubble, silicone oil, or perfluorocarbon. These liquids and gases are denser than atmospheric air. So meaning they're not heavy, they're just dense. So any air or gas, what will always a gas do? Go down or go up? It will go up. So it will always float up, correct? But because this gas is dense, it will put pressure against the retina. So let's go back to the tear picture. Here. So if the patient receives that gas or silicone bubble injection, so the doctor will inject, put a needle through here, and then inject a gas bubble inside or a silicone oil, what will it do once it rises? it's going to push this tear back against the eyeball. Now, in order for this to work, because the bubble, again, will rise, correct? What if the tear is on this side, like here in this picture? So the gas bubble will float where? Always straight up, correct? So therefore, if the tear is here, what will the doctor instruct the patient to do? Turn their head to a certain position in order for the gas to push the tear up. Now, it's important for the patient to understand the instruction because will it work unless they put their, they comply with that position? It will not work, All right? So they went through that injection, that painful injection for nothing. Are we clear? Okay, so that if it's vitrectomy, using either silicone or gas, then the important thing is the patient follows the post-op positioning. Let's wrap up the eye. Okay, let's go to macular degeneration now. There are two types of macular degeneration. There's a dry and a wet one. The dry type and so what is the macula? The macula is responsible for central vision. It's at the center of your retina. So we owe most of our vision to the macula. If you have the dry type, it's age-related. Just wear and tear. You know, the, the macula are as old as you are. Okay, So it, it deteriorated. What can we do about it? You can slow it down with the only treatment here is eye vitamins. So Bausch & Lomb, um, Cells Areds. Have you seen that? Like, or um, no, Areds, A-R-E-D-S. There's a bunch of vitamins in there anyway. So it's vitamin A, E. Okay, so a, a lot of, they combined a, a bunch of eye vitamins into that pill. And then you take it. That's it. That's the only treatment for the dry type. There's a second type, which is called wet. Now, the wet type, unlike dry, which is age-related, the wet type can occur at any age, which is sad. Now, this one is caused by abnormal blood vessels, neovascular. So these abnormal blood vessels are leaky meaning these, these capillaries are very fragile and they leak fluid. So therefore, can they decrease blood flow to the macula? Yes. So therefore, what's the treatment? So this patient is growing these abnormal blood vessels. So what's the treatment? Prevent those blood vessels from forming. So the treatment here is kind of like cancer because we want to prevent the growth of these abnormal blood vessels okay so we don't want these blood vessels leaking fluid and blood 
okay, damaging your retina and especially the macula. So it's um, we have a drug called the, the classification is endothelial growth factor inhibitor, which in in ten in you know in essence prevents the growth of new blood vessels. It's actually a cancer medication because cancer has the same property, right? So cancer cells can produce endothelial growth factor, which causes your our body to grow new blood vessels to feed the tumor. So since it works for cancer, then it will work here as well. But I have no question about that drug. And here's your <laughs> teaching. Uh, this is for eye injuries though. Uh, there's self-explanatory, you know, uh, eye protection. Like you would uh, think that these are common sense, but since they had to write this and put it in the chart, I guess. Look at that. Douse firework duds in water instead of attempting to relight them. I mean, why would you do that? Yeah, avoid standing near others when lighting fireworks. Yeah, okay. Here, never allow children to ignite fireworks. Anyway, so you have them, right? Okay. So if I put them on the question, like allow or encourage children to light fireworks. No. Okay. Sure, I'll put them on. Okay. Sure. I think that's about it for eyes. Let me make sure. Yes, that's it for chapter 47.